project I'm working on in Brussels is to look at how the experience of doing interpretation, doing simultaneous interpretation in particular, affects cognition. Previous studies have shown that bilinguals are better at some things than monolinguals, specifically at diverting attention to relevant things and ignoring irrelevant information. This is posited to be due to the fact that bilinguals have to maintain two languages all the time. So even if they're in a setting where nobody speaks their second language, they're still going to be activating that language and they still have to make sure that they're not using that language. Um, and so this exercise of using two languages all the time improves other functions. And so I thought about how interpreters have to do the same thing, but to a much higher level, that the expectations that they really produce very professional language and never use the second language, those expectations are really high. And so maybe we'd see the same differences um, in that group. But obviously you need to compare them to multilinguals rather than monolinguals. So the project I'm doing here, I'm looking at both simultaneous interpreters and then also multilinguals who speak the same number of languages, are the same age, same education, things like that, and seeing if I see those differences just due to the fact that this group has done interpretation. My name is Lara Babcock, and I'm a third year PhD student at CISA, um, which is the Scuola Internazionale Superiore di Studi Avanzati um, in Trieste, Italy. My background is quite diverse. I actually have a bachelor's in physics, and then I moved into linguistics, and I got a master's in that. <laughs> The tests that I have my participants do, the interpreters and the multilinguals, they, they actually do um, a number of tests. There are six that I'm really interested in. Um, so I'll give an example of one. They all have a similar format. It's a fairly famous test. It's called the Stroop test. So they see a, a, a color word. So if it's in English, they see the word red. But it can be written in red ink or in blue ink or in green ink or in yellow ink. And they actually have to tell me what the, what the color of the ink is, not what the word is. And reading is a really automatic process. It's really hard to turn it off. So you automatically read what the word is, and it's distracting to you. And so you have to focus on the relevant piece of information, the ink color, and not the irrelevant, the word that's written. Um, and so we see differences here between monolinguals and bilinguals, and hopefully also between interpreters and multilinguals. Hopefully the interpreters, and we've seen it with bilinguals, do this better, that they take less time to resolve the difference between the two. In all of the tasks we do, we, um, we measure the time that it takes people to respond and also what response they give, so we know if they got it right or wrong. Um, but the critical thing is looking at the time it takes them to respond. Um, and seeing that some groups are, take longer to respond or other groups take less time to respond. I'm also interested in looking at what the brain of an interpreter looks like. Um, and this is, it's a very difficult issue because um, number one, we normally want people to be still when we're scanning their brain. And so if you have somebody actually interpreting in the scanner, they're not still. Um, so this is kind of a, a technical issue that we're working on, but it, it's definitely being overcome. There are two different types of brain matter. There's gray matter, which is kind of, you could say knowledge. It's what's you know kind of sitting there. And then there's white matter that connects it. Um, and so you can use two different types of scanning to look at either gray matter or white matter. Um, just kind of at, at one point in time. Um, I'm also doing a long, longitudinal study, so it's a study over time, of interpretation students um, at the University of Trieste. What areas have they actually expanded in gray matter? What connections the white matter has gotten um, stronger through them learning to do interpretation? And that will be kind of a starting point for us to see where interpretation um, is located in the brain. Um, so in terms of using scanning as an aptitude testing tool, I don't know, I actually don't know if scanning um, would be the, the best thing. It would be years down the road, um, but definitely there are probably some other things that you could, that we can use now, um, and I'll definitely be looking at that in my longitudinal study um, in terms of IQ, 
working memory span, um, things like that. Maybe this ability to divert attention might also predict whether somebody will become a good interpreter or will pass their exams, things like that. So normally as you get older, um, processes start working a little bit slower, you have more difficulty focusing attention, things like that. But um, researchers, including um, Bialystok in Canada, um, has found that people who were, were bilinguals for their entire life um, are a little bit later to show these effects of slowing, slowing cognitive processes, and including in that getting Alzheimer's. So they actually showed a, a later onset, I think about five years later, that the bilinguals compared to monolinguals got Alzheimer's. So this is exactly the type of process that I'm looking at in the interpreters um, and looking to see if kind of interpretation has the same effect. Um, I won't be looking fully at the aging population in this study, um, but perhaps in other studies to see if, if uh, having that experience of doing interpretation lifelong also prevents uh, Alzheimer's from coming um, so early. <laughs> The field of looking at simultaneous interpretation in cognitive neuroscience is still quite small. Um, I can think of maybe three other institutions that have people working on it um, in Granada, in Geneva, and then maybe in Finland. There are people interested, but it's still a very small field. Um, it's growing out of this bilingualism field, which is, is becoming quite large, but this is also why I was interested in it, is that um, when I looked to see if there were studies on interpreters looking at the things I was interested in, there was just nothing there. Um, and so I felt like there was a big hole in uh, the literature that needed to be filled. Uh, it can be stressful when there are things very complicated, um, but at the, at the beginning it's a little bit overwhelming. It's difficult, <laughs> but it was surprising. Um, then I focused more on the, the mouth than, uh, than even the sound. Yeah. I wouldn't, I don't think I could do it all day long. No. <laughs>